Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to be kicking things off with AMD and news of its CPU market share. Back in 2017, prior to the launch of the Ryzen 1000 series CPUs, there was a lot of scepticism with the general market of whether AMD could deliver with its then new architecture. AMD had promised us that it would be hitting a 40% IPC gain and would be revolutionizing the desktop. But obviously, given the fact that Intel was so dominant and AMD's previous architectures had not hit all of the marks, there was just a healthy dose of skepticism whether they would be able to achieve this. And the good news is they didn't achieve it, they smashed it, hitting a 52% IPC gain over their older architecture, and furthermore, just completely and utterly undermining the offerings that Intel had at the time with Kaby Lake, simply by offering a vast amount more cores and threads and just better value. And this is something that AMD have continued to push now, of course, with the Zen 2 series of CPUs and Ryzen 3000. So, obviously, that has definitely ref been reflected in the sales, and the evidence of this is clear thanks to data collected by CPUbenchmark.net. AMD now have over 30% of the CPU market. That's actually its best result in 12 years. Furthermore, this is a 70% growth for the company since the launch of the original Ryzen CPUs back in 2017. So AMD, in terms of sales now, are no longer the underdog. They have an excellent mind share with consumers. There is, however, a big asterisk here, and that is that CPUbenchmark.net, as you can probably guess from the name, is a benchmark website. It is a website run by Passmark, and this is data that is then collected by the application you run on your system, and then displays those results publicly. So... The reason this is important, of course, is because enthusiasts tend to run those applications. Enthusiasts are, are curious what happens with their new graphics card and CPU combination with Firestrike and what happens with Cinebench. You get the idea by now. And it's not necessarily something that the average person is going to necessarily want to know or care about. What they care about is... Is Office 365 installed? Do my emails work? And do all of my other applications that I know and care about run? And if yes to those questions, then quite honestly, nothing else really bothers them. But obviously, this is not the only data that we've got that AMD are doing extremely well with the enthusiasts. This data is actually backed up by MindFactory.de and their sales reports back in September of this year, we actually see the German retailer uh, point out that the Ryzen architecture has an 81% relative market share with its sales, which is, well, staggering. In fact, it's increased further since the launch of the Ryzen 3000 series back in July. And obviously, one of the things we've seen recently is AMD are doing its darndest to get CPUs to the marketplace, which is obviously reflecting this data. So this is great news for us as enthusiasts, and it obviously will impact uh, the average individual as well, particularly now that uh, many more companies are starting to offer AMD-based products. But the reason I'm happy about this to be honest, is that it does reflect that people don't necessarily care about the brand. All they care about is getting the best price slash performance for the money. It also means that Intel are being forced to counter. We'll get into some Intel stuff in just a moment. But we obviously saw just yesterday that there was a leaked benchmark of an i3 CPU. It's four cores, eight threads, and it is going to be an i3 CPU with hyper-threading. Now, this is awesome for us as customers. Think about, think about it this way. An i7 7700K is essentially the same as an i3 now. And that means that Intel are being forced to quickly reevaluate how it offers its products, which is obviously thanks to AMD. I am going to be extremely, extremely 
excited to see what happens over the next couple of years in not just the CPU arena, but also in GPU as well. And in somewhat related news, we have a couple of Intel pieces, the first of which was discovered by Momomo, and it seems to indicate the release date of Comet Lake. So according to the slide posted, assuming it's accurate, we can see that in the end of December this year, we have prod. And no, it's not people randomly coming up to you in the street and bodging you with their finger. Instead, this means that we have Comet Lake hitting production at the end of December. It looks like maybe the 51st or the 52nd week of the year. And then, of course, we can see that this is continuing through January, February, and March with RTS coming essentially the end of February. So realistically, um, this means that we're going to be seeing the Comet Lake series from Intel hitting store shelves at the end of February, potentially early March next year. So that means for the next five to six-ish months, let's say five months, given it's already the 12th as I'm recording this, we will not have Comet Lake and AMD basically have free reign with the Ryzen 3000 series and it's going to be very fascinating to see when AMD launch Zen 3 as well and the Ryzen 4000 series obviously with uh, the Ryzen 3000 series it was the 7th of July 7 7 2019 which I leaked back in the day and obviously AMD stuck to that with Nave as well I don't know if they'd launch uh, Zen 3 so early um and it's going to be very curious to see if they do that, because in theory, anyway, that would mean that Intel only have three to four months uh, with Comet Lake not being countered with a Zen 3 lineup of CPUs. How well Comet Lake does against AMD is going to be down to a few factors to me. We know that there's no architectural changes thanks to the benchmarks that we've seen leak on the internet so for example there's no changes to say the amount of cash on a cpu or anything like that um, so it's really going to come down to what clock frequencies they can squeeze out of a 10 core part to be fair uh, looking at cascade lake and reports that it's hitting 5 gigahertz with only liquid cooling it's possible that intel could squeeze five, uh, 5 gigahertz out of a 10 core chip uh, with all core, maybe. We'll have to wait on that one. Uh, that's what I've heard from a couple of people, that the clock frequencies are going to be higher for Comet Lake, but at the end of the day, I, I want to see just how much they manage to squeeze out of it. And the second uh, thing, of course, is the pricing. And the third is also how they decide to separate the different uh, offerings. I think that enabling hyper-threading across all of the SKUs is the minimum that they can do. I'd also like to see much better overclocking support across all of the SKUs as well. Uh, at the end of the day though, AMD definitely have Intel under a lot of stress. This is particularly true given one of my sources has told me that Zen 3 has an over 8% IPC gain compared to Zen 2, which is obviously pretty profound, and this is something I discussed in a video yesterday, so you can go ahead and check that out if you missed it. Lots of Tiger Lake Generation 12 graphics compiler code has just been added to Mesa 19.3. There's still several weeks before the window of 19.3 uh, is over with, before it can ship, which obviously is going to take place in December, so we still technically have more time for Generation 12 stuff to be added to it. But according to website foreignx.com, there have been dozens upon dozens of new code added for Generation 12 graphics. And this is going to be for Vulkan, OpenGL as well. Now, don't forget that it's already been confirmed, kind of oopsie by Intel, that Tiger Lake slash Generation 12 graphics is actually the biggest change to Intel's graphics ISA going back to the original uh, i965. So that's that's actually pretty profound, and it does tie into the fact that uh, Intel themselves have also said that the target for Tiger Lake uh, iGPUs is to be able to play uh, esports titles 1080p 60 FPS. In the final piece of news for today, let's talk about NVIDIA's GTX 1660 Super. 
The cards have finally been confirmed thanks to videocards.com who have grabbed images of the Zotac variants of the card with their own 8-pin power connector. So the primary difference between Super and the Vanilla cards comes down to the memory type. The vanilla cards are outfitted with GDDR5 memory running at 8 GBPS, whereas the super variants are outfitted with GDDR6 memory running at 14 GBPS. But from the leaks that have occurred so far, we are looking at the TU116300 core still, and we still have 1408 CUDA cores, uh, 80 texture mapping units and finally 48 ROPs, although it's possible potentially we could have a small clock frequency bump. Supposedly that this card is going to be about 5-10% to 10 better than the GTX 1660 vanilla, which means that it's going to be super duper close to the GTX 1660 Ti. Technically speaking, this means that the RX 5500 XT is going to be cheaper, but Theoretically, the 1660 Super will be a little bit faster. This is definitely one of those GPUs that I'm not really excited about its existence. Um, I think that NVIDIA's lineup is already quite enough, to be honest, in the 16 series without further adding to it with a Super card, although it's going to be curious what they actually do if any of the older GPUs are going to end up EOL, end of line. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully, you've enjoyed it. If you did, then the normal stuff. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I wish you an amazing day. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.